sometimes we have this thought of the sun sort of being parched and drying us out and shriveling us up. Um, it actually creates a lot of inner lubrication that is really key for health and longevity and just plain old, you know, beauty. Hey friends, and welcome back to the Medicine Stories podcast, where we are remembering what it is to be human upon the earth, following our guiding principles that story is medicine, magic is real, and healing is open-ended and endless. I am your host, Amber Magnolia Hill. Today on episode 67, I'm sharing my interview with Nadine Artemis. Nadine is the author of Renegade Beauty, which is one of my favorite all-around health reference books. I've been wanting to interview her for years, and so I'm so happy to finally be bringing this to you. Back in the fall, I planted some tulip bulbs for the first time. I love tulips, but had never put any around my own home. And one of these tulips survived the mole that haunts us in our front yard right now. And it's like a multi-petal tulip. It's red. It's so beautiful and lush. There are so many petals on it. I don't even remember buying like the multi-petaled variety. So I was, we were quite confused when it first came up. But only having one bright red tulip to focus on in that spot in the yard means that we've been paying a lot of attention to it. And what we've been noticing is that in the morning, it just turns its whole face to the east to welcome the sun. And throughout the day, it follows the path of the sun through the sky until in the evening, it's completely facing west. And I know that many plants do the same, that dandelions are open when the sun is shining and closed when the sun goes down, even after they've been picked like that first day, they will remain open in your home, on your basket drying until the sun goes down and then they close up. And so it's just got me thinking about the relationship between the sun and all living creatures on the planet. I mean, can you imagine trying to help a plant thrive by keeping it out of the sun? It's totally absurd. And yet so many humans are staying out of the sun, whether because we're working all day on our computer screens or because we've been told that the sun is the enemy, the enemy. I remember watching um, a new segment about a year ago, all about skin cancer and the importance of sunscreen. And it ended with the words, just remember who the real enemy is, the sun. And I just burst out laughing that this is like where we are in the culture with how backwards our understanding of health is, <laughs> that we're being told that the literal source of all life on earth is our enemy. And so of course there's a way to be wise about your interaction with the sun. I'm not like guns blazing, just get out there and burn yourself. Like absolutely not. And Nadine and I get into all the nuances of this in this conversation today, but just hold in mind that you are like that tulip. You are a creature of the earth, which means that you are made to be in conversation with the sun. Literally, literally, you've got vitamin D receptors in every cell of your body and they need that vitamin D for your body to function optimally. So this is a really dense and rich conversation. You're probably going to want to be taking notes um, or you know what I often do when I'm listening to a podcast and I can't take notes is I just take a screenshot of the spot where there was something I want to go back and learn more about so I can remember the timestamp later. Um, and you know, also our ancestors would not have survived and we would not be here today if the sun was the killer that we make it out to be. Just another thought to hold in mind as you probably have a lot of very old beliefs overturned 
during this conversation today. I know that my mind was totally blown when I first started learning about Nadine's work and many other people's work too, and about the importance of sun exposure, you know, just goes against everything I've been told my entire life. So also, if there's like more information that you want at the end of this very long conversation, it's absolutely going to be in Nadine's book, Renegade Beauty. Um, so if you find yourself having more questions, check out her website, Living Libations, and check out that book, especially like specific recommendations for things to put on your skin before and after sun exposure. Although we do talk a little bit about that at the end of the conversation. Um, you know, I gave the book Renegade Beauty to my 13 year old daughter yesterday. I was going through my book collection and getting rid of just a few <laughs> books and and definitely not getting rid of that one, but she was with me when I was doing that. And I was like, Hey, you know, maybe you want to check this book out. And much to my delight, she took it. She never literally, I don't think ever once has taken my book recommendation and took it up to her room. And this morning when I went in there, she was reading it and I would never give her a book that I thought would give her the message that she's not beautiful as she is, that there are external things she has to do to make herself more beautiful. And that is not what kind of book Renegade Beauty is. It's about living truly in harmony with the elements around us, with the earth, with the plants, with the sun, so that our inner radiance can shine through. And there's a ton of good practical information, as you'll hear in this conversation around the sun, around botanical medicines, um, breast health, uh, like what kind of deodorants to use, um, dental health, and the oral microbiome. Basically, any page she could open up to in that book, I am so glad that she's reading it and learning the information she's learning, because like so many teenagers, she doesn't want to hear it from her mom. So if you would like to check out the book, I recommend buying it, of course, but it's also going to be the Patreon offering for this episode is a giveaway of the book that Nadine will sign and send to you. And so as always, you can um, enter this giveaway at patreon.com slash medicine stories. And it's going to end, oh, may I always forget to write down on my intro show notes the day of giveaway endings, May 19th, Tuesday, May 19th. Um, so yeah, I can head over there, patreon.com slash medicine stories to be entered to win a copy of the book. One final note before we get into it is that I plan on slowing down production of the podcast over the summer. Um, just feels like natural thing to do. And I've been writing lately. I've been writing. Writing is truly what I'm here to do. And I've been too busy to do it, like so many parents out there. But, you know, one of the things that, one of the sad, sad truths of life is that time is finite. And all the time, it takes so much time to put this podcast together that I spend doing this is just hours and hours and hours a week I can put into writing this book that I'm working on. So I'm going to do that. I'll probably still put the show out once a month, at least, maybe more. Who knows what will happen? No promises either way. But I absolutely love doing this podcast, and so I'm not going anywhere, but I might slow down. Okay, Nadine Artemis is the creator of Living Libations, a luxury line of organic, wild-crafted, non-GMO serums, elixirs, and essential oils for those seeking the purest of the pure botanical, natural health, and beauty products on the planet. She is a beauty philosopher, aromacologist, and botanical muse. She is also the author of Renegade Beauty and Holistic Dental Care. Nadine's botanical inclinations led her on a petal path to adventure in creating organic beauty balms, reviving elixirs, effective oral care, and perfumed poetry to quench the natural yearnings of many. She is an innovative aromacologist developing immune-enhancing formulas and medicinal blends for health and wellness. Her healing creations, along with her concept of renegade beauty, encourage effortlessness 
eschew regimes and inspire people to rethink conventional notions of beauty and wellness. Okay, y'all, let's dive right in to this interview with Nadine Artemis. Hi, Nadine. Welcome to Medicine Stories. I am so happy to be able to talk with you today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of your work, everything you do. I had heard you talk about the sun and had been so struck by what we culturally get so wrong about the sun. And then a very good friend of mine had your book, Renegade Beauty. And I was kind of like, okay, I don't I don't really care about beauty, you know, like I, that looks cool. And I love what she has to say about the sun. But then I looked at the book and I was like, oh my gosh, like this woman is brilliant. And this goes so far beyond, you know, our surface ideas of beauty in this culture and just really fell in love with your understanding of plant consciousness, floral consciousness, solar consciousness. And I would really love to begin there with the sun, because as I said, it's it's crazy how backwards our understanding of the sun is in our culture. So can we start? Well, first, how about we start by you telling us how you came to be doing what you're doing, and maybe you can talk especially about how your ideas of what the sun is and does for us and why it's so important for human cells to interact with the sun, how that Mm -hmm. came into your life. Yeah. I mean, I think the sun's always a great place to start because it's so, such a, an important part of our lives and in the realm of beauty, I think of it as, you know, the primary, a primary cosmoetic which is when we can just think of the elements like the sun and water and air and the botanical gifts as the earth as, as like partners in our beauty and beauty. I mean, you know, by the widest expression of like health and feeling good and well being because they're essential and really that's, what's going to refresh us and resource us and revive us and reveal our inner beauty because, you know, beauty is not something that's just applied and it's not really going to come out of a bottle per se. Um, but it's like that engagement with the elements. So that's one of the reasons why I like the sun. And, uh, oh, my God, where should we start with the sun? <laughs> and you, I mean, your whole journey, tell us anything you want about how you came to be doing the work that you're doing in the world. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I was a little, little child as we all were, you know, loved, loved dabbling, um, in the forest and making potions and stuff and even making potions at, at home with my mom's things. Um, you know, and then by grade nine, it was really neat because I got to do like a science fair project and pick my own subject. And I realized I wanted to do it on perfumery and I was (laughs) obsessed with perfumes at the time. You know, they were all the bottles of, literal like poison like it was like christian yours poison or magic or like all the ones i even mixed them but i didn't know like there was sort of no rooted substance about where they were coming from and i was exploring that at the library and the history is just so rich and you know ancient egyptology and you know perfumes that were even mixed with wine or mead and you know incense which is really a part of it because sort of the some of the first perfumes were really the smoke, the, the, the smoke of incense. Um, and so I love that. And and my great grandfather was also, uh, the president of the London Egyptology society and would (laughs) go on archeological digs. So I had his paintings and there was a beautiful resonance. So that took me through those realms and, and that made me discover essential oils, um, for the first time, because the book talked about these, what the substances really were. And I just love that, you know, I just, it was such a good moment of putting all the things that I love together, you know, for school. So that was also fun because school could often be boring, Um, you know, and then just having kind of a classic teenagehood and exploring all kinds of, uh, you know, products and mixing things in my bathroom, but really thinking that I'd come across, oh, the the body shop, oh, that was so fun and green beauty. Mm -hmm. But then by the time I was 18 and at university and really understanding about, um, you know, where food came from and environmental connections and food processing and how is it connected to environment and health and understanding, um, 
really the whole structure of a supermarket and what's on the label and really getting a grip on all of that, which was just so mind opening, really that quickly transferred to understanding like what I was putting on my body in the way of cosmetics and that, you know, that the the body shop is kind of basically BS and you know mm-hmm. there had the cucumber toner never saw a cucumber <laughs> the peach fuzzy peach bath oil had never been in peach there was no pineapple in the face well you know all that kind of stuff so that was and I really just started making my own food as from that moment forward always eating organic never processed and making my own cosmetics as I was going through school which I was like going into like philosophy and women's studies. And it was great because then I was doing projects on like, um, you know, women's health and like the, the dangers of birth control and the pill and IUD and projects on midwifery and, you know, Hey, what's Madonna doing in that video? You know, I just like <laughs> all of it or like Tao ancient practices of Taoism or, um, which, you know, also brought an understanding of health and beauty. So it was really very cross-cultural, transhistorical understanding of, uh, women's bodies and, um, you know, a lot of the Western history that has made a uh, very poor choices around the medicalization of women's bodies. So it was just so fruitful and, I saw beauty and our understanding of it. It could be also this radical, you know, avenue to really, you know, beauty can be radical and and exploring what's beautiful on the planet can be radical. And that really just, just spoke to my soul. And at the same time, I was just swirled and diving into the history even more than I had, obviously, at that time of, of doing the perfume project for a science fair. So I was reading ancient texts and looking at, you know, reading about raw materials and ancient Egyptian recipes and like, how could I get that? How could I smell that? I wanted to catch a whiff of, you know, what it was like in ancient culture. So I had to remake things. And um, then I I started importing essential oils because I couldn't find all the beautiful ones that I had read about. And then just really getting in touch with a whole other world of quality and, and smell that just was not what was bottled at the health food stores. And then I started a store and, you know, (laughs) on and on it goes. (laughs) Yeah, you followed what was calling to you. That's that's really beautiful. And I I love hearing, too, that there's this, like, women's empowerment piece underneath it all. And, of course, there is. You know, that makes (laughs) perfect sense now reflecting on your book. I love the emphasis on breast health. and But I'm curious, um, were you always a sun worshiper? Yeah, even though it wasn't allowed, but that was partly part of the fun too. Because in my, you know, in my school before university life, I was always very much, you know, questioning things, and I was a lovely challenge to all of my teachers, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and I was at a private school, and we weren't, you know, there was restrictions on uniform and stuff. And my mom was also just dutifully, you know put on your sunscreen and don't get burnt as, as was normal for the time. Um, so we would find all kinds of creative ways to get sun exposure because all I knew was that it felt so good. You know, like I felt good. My skin felt good. I felt good physically. I felt good, you know, uh, emotionally, like I like the sunshine So yeah, that's what we would do. We would line up at school. We'd kind of push down the socks, try and hike up the skirts. We'd put um, tin foil in our textbooks so we could get reflection (laughs) off the rays. (laughs) You know, but we also had baby oil and stuff too, which you know, I would shudder at putting on my body now. Right. And then combining that with like swimming in a chlorine pool. Right. You know. Um, is, there's a quote in your book. I'm not, I didn't write down who said it, but I know you were quoting someone else where you wrote that the effect of sunlight on our energy system is like a battery being charged. And mm-hmm. ever, it's so true ever since I read your book last year. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I haven't been taking advantage of like the, the free thing in the sky that literally gives life to the entire planet. Um, without which we absolutely could not survive. And it has so many health benefits for us as humans that I didn't even know about. And so since then, I've really taken your advice to heart. And 
like today it's finally warm and sunny enough to lay out for the first time in weeks. But I know that any time with us, yay, even <laughs> just for, you know, 15 minutes, it's, I'm recharged. I'm completely revitalized. It's, it's like I just got a massage or some kind of body work done. It's so mm-hmm. incredible. And it's so amazing that we're all overlooking that and being told this is bad. Go indoors, cover yourself. Oh yeah. I mean, there's so that's, and I love, oh, I, love I love the sun. Cause there, a, we all get to feel it. We all know what I'm talking about. And, um, then through history and, you know, whether that's sort of like the recorded history or our, our, our artistic history or our philosophical history. I mean, there's just so much juice, right. With the sun and then like, and then science, there's so much fascinating science around the sun that I'm, it's, you know, I mean, on one level, I could just study that for the rest of my life. I mean, I got too much other stuff to do, but it's so <laughs> rich and juicy, you know? So, I mean, oh, I was so happy that I had a chance to write about it in a deeper level or even to talk about it now. I mean, from the the beautiful books that were written around the turn of the 19th century, there's so much good stuff that, you know, you, now that we have like a deeper understanding of science on some level that we can like look back and then combine that previous knowledge with our current knowledge, which is so rich. And, um, yeah, I mean, just, and then we've got the current studies, which there's a near three, about 3000 studies that show in varying ways that when we are amply, you know, amply supplied with vitamin D and our vitamin D receptors, that, you know, all of these diseases, you know, are less of an issue. Like literally to be sufficient in vitamin D, your chance of developing breast cancer is slashed by 50%. The number one cause of juvenile diabetes is a vitamin D deficiency in the natal prenatal period for the mother, Mm. you know, like so many connections, you know, not to, you know, and then many types of cancer or MS, like all these things can really get solved with vitamin D. So a question for our modern times could be, you know, do we just, uh, forgo sun contact and take vitamin D because we have it now. Um, well, obviously we've had it for a while, and there is some yeah, kind of food sources, but a lot of it's more like looking at the food sources to kick in sort of these different catalytic actions in the body, um, which is sort of another path, which we can totally talk about. Yeah, I have um, questions. You know, <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, at the heart of it all is we are thankful to have the vitamin D, but it's a different kind of substance. And it's a fat-soluble substance, and it does show that you know, even sup- through supplementation is, is valuable for many people, um, you know, for their overall innate immune system and health. However, when our skin interacts with the sun, it's a water-soluble vitamin D that's created. And then a whole bunch of s- stuff, <laughs> that's for scientific words, stuff <laughs> happens in the body that we know of, and there's going to be stuff that we don't even know of yet. Like very necessary and healthy microbial peptides are created, um, which are just so essential for the immune system. And then, you know, that creates other, other things that are going to benefit the microbiome, be a food supply for the microbiome, help cell signaling systems. So it kind of juices us up, juices us up from the inside you know, we're, we create also a healthy cholesterol sulfate is created with that catalytic action of sunbeams on our skin. And that's a very essential cholesterol sulfate that is essential for the sex hormones, among other things. So it, it well, sometimes we have this thought of the sun sort of being parched and drying us out and shriveling us up. Um, it actually creates a lot of inner lubrication that is really key for health and longevity and just plain old, you know, beauty, for lack of a better word, uh, you know, like as in beauty, as in good, healthy skin and that glow and helping to get rid of acne or eczema and keeping the topical microbiome system on the skin healthy. 
And um, it's interesting now because, you know, we're blaming some skin conditions on the sun that actually have their roots in other things. Like uh, most melanomas root, I'm sorry, not melanoma, melasma, which is the hyperpigmentation of the skin. Most of that is caused through a dietary um, ingestion of polyunsaturated fatty acids, like our country eating, you know, 20% of their fat from mazola and canola and those really unhealthy rancid oils, or applying things topically to the skin that are chemicals like sunscreens and then going into the sun, or, you know, hydrating with things like Coca-Cola and then going into the sun, different things. So we really want to think about what we're offering to the sun with our bodies, but also know that like, you know, uh, the injections and the self-tanning sprays and all of that are actually like what we're kind of doing to make up for the lack of sunlight is actually harming us more than the sunlight. Mm -hmm. And I bet, I mean, you could probably write a whole book on what we're doing to make up for the lack of sunlight, (laughs) all the ways that not doing what we are meant to do, what all of our ancestors did, what our Mm -hmm. species, like every other species on the planet evolved doing, which is interacting with the sun. Um, If, you know, if we're not doing that, which we are literally told not to do, look at this cascade of health problems that can arise from that and all the things that we're scrambling then to fix in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, I really Mm -hmm. love this idea that you bring forth of human photosynthesis. Like, you know, how literally, as you write, our cells are made to interact with the sun. We have these vitamin D receptors covering our body. You say even in places the sun doesn't shine. And, you know, clearly the human body has evolved to take in the sun's rays and do all sorts of amazing things with it. You read Mm -hmm. that vitamin D repairs organs, boosts immune function, lowers insulin levels, reduces blood pressure, boosts neuromuscular functioning, and interacts with more than 2,000 genes. I mean, that's – it's like – um. What's that? Uh, it's like epigenetics, right? Like we're yeah. we're using yeah. the sun to turn on the good genes and turn off the bad ones because vitamin yes. D also um, makes apoptosis happen. It it helps the cells kill the cancerous cells that are starting constantly in our bodies, mm-hmm. or just this, yeah, the cells that need to go. Mm-hmm. You know, the that it's it, apoptosis is cell death, and it's the it's the healthy cell death, right. Yeah. And that's so, and that's so, you know, fasting can help with that long term mm-hmm. or intermittent, um, just eating good food. And oh my gosh, going out and being in the sun. That's amazing. I mean, I, someone won the Nobel Prize for looking at that a few years ago, you know, and here's like, oh, just go in the sun and do something you enjoy anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That was for heliotherapy and um, the, meaning the sun, you know, studying how the sun could, uh, you know, help with disease, help eradicate diseases. And that was at the turn of the century. And then there was, you know, a lot of development in that area to where there was clinics in Switzerland in the 1920s, where people were, you know, healing rickets and um, a lot of bone diseases, tuberculosis, and really having amazing results. It was quite famous even worldwide at the time. Yeah. And then things turned after World War II, where, you know, we became a little more chemicalized as a nation, as a as really a globe, as a planet. Um, and that's kind of the, that's what we kind of have to undo. A lot of that fear and pro, like, you know, sort of lobbied, what I call it, we've been lobbied into a loss of sunlight, like literally mm. by lobby groups, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. And then issues around skin cancer, um, you know, th- that's a serious thing. Melanoma is, is you know, not something anybody wants to get, but the studies and the science, and again, these are studies that I have in my book from, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine, Cochrane, the Cochrane Review, which um, looks, combines studies and then kind of does new data from there. So very, you know, prestigious in some realms, uh, resources, but just talking about, you know, that, that it, that it doesn't sh- seem to be statistically uh, correct that the sun causes melanoma as people with more 
recreational sun exposure have less chance of getting it. The closer you live to the equator, the less chance you have of getting it. So, you know, there's still a lot to learn, but I think it involves, you know, other, there's probably some other underlying causes. And of course we do want to be careful and we don't want to get burned, especially repeatedly in the same area. Although there's a lot you can do to help bring speedy healing to that area. Um, but what's also important to know is that the body, the DNA, is able to handle a burn much more efficiently and properly with our own body systems than our body can handle being in the sun all day with sunscreen and what that, that does to our body systems. Mm -hmm. So we can allow the DNA to process the heat and, and to take care of the burn. And we can, there's a lot of things that really help us topically to mitigate the effects of a burn to an area and where sunscreen can cause a lot of damage is, you know, obviously there's a lot of chemical ingredients, you know, and besides the hormone, um, the endocrine disruption and the chemicals that are showing up in the body. And there's, there's just some active ingredients that get further ignited through sunlight. Like the main one, oxybenzene is, is classified as non-carcinogenic until it's exposed to sunlight. So there's like little chemical, you know, so insane. It's so insane. <laughs> That's been banned like maybe in Europe, but it's still a main thing. But then, you know, something else will be thrown in to replace it. And then in 10 years, we'll be like, oops. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's that and that can cause more freckling and moles and different things like that. But then another main issue of sunscreen is that it separates the UVA from the UVB rays. So now we're sitting in the sun past, you know, maybe when we would normally like because our warning system's now been covered over in sort of this chemical saran wrap. And so we're not getting just that, hey, it's getting pink. I will seek shade or wear a shirt. Um, so that kind of gets turned off. The phrase then, that you use in your book is that it anesthetizes your skin. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're getting solar rays without UVB. So now we're not getting any vitamin D, but then, and especially in the name of beauty, now we're just receiving UVA without UVB. And so the UVA is actually damaging on its own. So when we start separating, kind of like, you know, when we make pharmaceuticals from whole plants mm -hmm. and then it's not in the whole form anymore. So it might have more side effects. Mm -hmm. That's sort of like, what happens when we're dividing the rays. So we're it, shutting down the skin's and the body's warning system. We're mm -hmm. separating out the UVAs and UVBs, making it more dangerous, what we're getting from mm -hmm. the sun. And we're baking toxic chemicals into our bodies. Yeah. All at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you know what's so funny? For many, the sun still feels so good that even as they're doing that, they're still happier, you know, being mm -hmm. in the sun. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, ah, uh, gosh, there's so many places I want to go. But I really <laughs> like how you tied it into this shift with World War II. And I love the history that you give of the solariums and how there were doctors and, like you said, well-known research showing that just sunlight can cure serious diseases in people. Um, yeah, even Florence Nightingale was like really working to convert hospitals to have like facing south and all these windows because they were cleaner rooms and less bacteria. And, right. You know, sunlight's yeah. the best disinfectant, as it is said. Yes. And then they are, um, it's activating the immune system. Like you, you're right that the vi our vitamin D receptors are like the basis of our immune system. Yeah. Our and it's literally cleaning our blood. Mm hmm. Yes. That's so interesting. Um, it's so basic. So, yeah, to tie it into just like this bigger historical rush towards scientism and control really is what, you know, what I see and basing this a lot on Charles Eisenstein's work, who's been a past guest. We've just been moving as a society and as a global culture now towards more and more control and micromanaging of everything. And a lot of that is 
um, yes, yeah, synthesizing natural substances, turning to chemicals, and disconnecting ourselves further and further from the natural world. So uh-huh. this all just, you know, ties in perfectly to how our culture and our species relationship with the sun has shifted so abruptly with very real consequences. Um, so yes, just <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole really the whole world economy. Well, obviously, that's too blanket because there's going to be farming and different things. But let's just say like kind of a a metropolitan workforce, like a general economy of a city, right? There's like, it's all based on not being exposed to the sun for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. We have to function like that. But, you know, we don't even have, we're not even a culture with a siesta to like go mm-hmm. home and enjoy some, you know, an afternoon in the sun or that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, it's going to take a lot to rework that. Uh, kind of thinking because once you really learn about the sun you know you want to kind of get your exposure in as much as possible to kind of build up you know it's you get out of a mind frame of like a winter vacation or like it's Saturday um, because you kind of try and want you kind of want to try and fit it in where you can you know like at work we have a a sun deck and it's literally like please Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know go outside and have a break out there, have lunch out there. Um, yeah, because we kind of need to get it in our bodies. And it, going back to that, that's being a solar panel is you kind of, especially for us when we live in, um, you know, I think you may have a winter too, or we definitely have mm-hmm. from November to, you know, March, you're not, the rays aren't really that long to generate a lot of vitamin D. So we kind of have to store up. And, and since I've been more committed to this and understanding on a deep level, that like, it's not just great to feel the sun, but I really need to like build it in and have a base with my melanin. That's just different. You know, like even in January now, my skin is just different than it was like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Cause sure it would be tan before, but like now I make sure that it's just really a part of sort of the palette of my body. And I, I can really just feel it taking me through the winter months when I've stocked up in summer. Mm -hmm. That's so good to know that you can store it up. And yeah, what I've learned from you, and I want to go back to melanoma and cancer. So don't let me forget, because I know Mm -hmm. people are still sitting at home going, but what about, Mm -hmm. Um, but is to, you know, as soon as you're able to, as soon as those sun rays are long enough, get yourself outdoors and in the sun early in the springtime and start acclimating your body to the sun, because of course you don't want to burn all at once and that you know that's what I've done my whole life is like June comes around and we're like okay let's go to the lake or the river and then my skin is completely unkissed by the sun and I'm loading up the sunscreen or staying in the shade or getting burnt and so (laughs) starting last year after reading your book I I look you know when when is the right time for me to lay out? Is it a good enough day? If I have to put up like wind shields, I will, or mm-hmm. na- neighbor shields. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's amazing. It just, oh my gosh, it feels so good. It completely changes the course of the rest of my day after I've done it. And I was able to build up enough of a base tan last year that, you know, I didn't feel like I, I wasn't afraid to not have sunscreen on when I was at the river. So Perfect. So perfect. Yeah. We just, um, come back recently. So part of our winter goal is always to get a little bit of sunshine. Um, and then we just come back and I, and then by the time I come back, so, you know, the rays are getting long enough. And if it's a sunny day, like I'm out there and it's kind of fun when it's like when it's colder air, it actually is even better for muscle tone. So it's like a very micro micro workout lying in the sun because it does create muscle tone. Nice. And then, um, you know, and it's longer, like if you, cause it's, it's like, so it's really nice. The early spring tanning, because you can really just drink it in. It's a gentler, softer sun, mm. you know, I mean, everybody's going to be different, but most people you could get a good hour if yeah. you can, yeah. you know, and then yeah. I was advised to people, if you're worried about wrinkles on your face, you, you know, even though once you really get into it, you realize it's probably not changing your skin tone in that way. If you're, you know, if you're eating healthy and that kind of stuff and keeping hydrated, but, you know, then just forgo the face and, you know, you've got all the whole rest of your body, the whole backside, the sides, you know, mm-hmm. and just bring it in. 
Yeah, I'm like constantly shifting angles, you know, get the yeah, side, totally. the side, a little more of the side, the top side. Yeah, it's like um, got to rotate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so let's go, let's go back to melanoma and skin cancer. You really have, you know, quite a um, well-cited section on this in your book. And like you talked about all the different studies, the meta studies, and there's even a whole book written just mm-hmm. about like how everything we think we know about skin cancer and melanoma is wrong. And something that I find so interesting, not only did one study find that malignant melanoma is less common in children and adults who work or play outside, but another study showed that melanoma is far more common for people who work indoors. And it seems like especially that perhaps um, fluorescent lights can be a source Uh of melanoma. Oh my God. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Which is huge. And then there's another, I think, I don't know if it's it's the same study or if it's that one, but that was written um, before uh, we had the whole workforce looking at a computer screen. Uh-huh. Like, so now who's to say what's going to, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> right. now we're getting a whole other kind of light and way less. Like, I, we just have changed that so much. If you think about it, in the 90s, people were still using typewriter I mean obviously there was computers but you know what I mean like yeah a lot of work was done like pens and papers and typewriters still it (laughs) wasn't guaranteed that like because some days I'm like wow how is everything I'm doing mainly about a computer right Mm -hmm. now you know except Mm -hmm. for my formulating it's like every job seems to have come down to a computer screen at some point including podcast interviews (laughs) yeah there you go yeah and that book is really um amazing it's it's really in depth it's hard to find now because it's like it's a thicker kind of textbook Mm. but it's well worth it i um book finder is a great resource and and also in my book i i do list out some of the older books um so there's a lot more little rabbit holes people can go into I've got like over 500 end notes in my book. So yeah. there's, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I go. love all the citations. <laughs> the book is called The Sun and the Quote Epidemic of Melanoma Myth on Myth! Exclamation point by Dr. Bernard Ackerman. <laughs> yeah, but, and he was really amazing. He died in 2009, but he, I, he seemed like a real maverick. He was the founding father of dermatopathology, which is you know, the more serious study of skin and diseases, it's a little bit more Mm -hmm. hardcore than Mm -hmm. a dermatologist. And, um, yeah. And he was, I find he's even quite a radical writer, kind of poetic too. Yeah. Like, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) it was so neat to find this doctor brother. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Oh, that's so fun finding someone across time. Um, Mm -hmm. oh, well, a friend of mine, her husband died, very quickly within two months of a melanoma diagnosis oh, a couple years wow. ago. And we had four children and, you know, I, I forget how the subject came up, but something about he, he hadn't been outside month much. And he was, he was even diagnosed in October, died in December. And I said, did he work under fluorescent lights? And she said, oh yeah, he worked in a warehouse. Oh, and wow. she was like, whoa, when I told her that, you know, she was like, oh my gosh, that totally makes sense. We didn't know, wow. you know, we didn't know yeah. that he was at risk. Was he a sun lover or anything like that? Or I don't know. Normal? I think yeah. he was working a lot because he was yeah. supporting four kids. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and then also a meta review of studies. So this is looking at many different studies showed no correlation between melanoma and sun exposure. I mean that, yeah, it's just so fascinating when everything you've been told (laughs) turns out to not have basis. Yes. Um, meanwhile, over 2,500 studies have linked lack of natural sunlight derivative D3 to increased cancer risk. That's also just the facts. Yeah. Which, you know. <laughs> um, did I say increased cancer risk? I hope I did. I think so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's then talk about food and the role that food plays in. I love how you, you brought this up earlier that we need to think about basically how we are treating ourselves, what we are putting into and on our bodies as our offering with the sun. 
this mm-hmm. is we're not just passive recipients of the sun's rays, but we can play an active role in how in optimizing our bodies for getting the most nourishment and the least harm from that relationship. Um, so you talk about different kinds of foods we can be intaking. Maybe we can look at that a little bit, like chlorophyll from greens and pigment rich plants. Like, let us know what what can we eat to help, <laughs> um, you know, wisen up our interaction with the sun. Yeah, for sure. Like uh, really concentrated greens. So like like chlorophyll, like literally just drops of chlorophyll in water is one of my favorite. And maybe a drop of peppermint for fun, uh, like in the sun hydration drinks. Um, also, there's a number of studies that show food rich, rich in pigments create our own internal sunscreen. Mm. Which, oh my God, you're just uh, reminding me, um, we were fortunate to be in Hawaii in March and I was just on the beach and then there was just a real, you know, beach guy. You could just, he's... I think he was even flying a kite. You just knew he was like, however he created his life, he was at the beach a lot. And then he was talking to a couple on a towel nearby and he was telling them about vitamin D. And then he was like, and I take a lot of ass attacks of them. And I'm like, oh my God, he's totally on it. Which is, a, that's a red algae. Mm. And it's actually harvested in the Hawaiian islands. And it's it's a really great supplement on a number of levels and uh, it really is good for internal lubrication and an internal sunscreen. Wow. So, so any amazing. like these, these red and purples, are these what are helping us with that internal SPF? Yeah. Reds and purples, but really, you know, green also, um, you know, and red and green. I always feel like even inside our bodies, we're probably kind of combining them in fun ways and making purple, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with a bit of imagination. But I'm sure it's just good having a mixed palette. And then also topically, you know, plants that are richer in pigments are also our friends when it comes to even getting different kinds of protection. Um, so from food and plants, we can get a lot of, uh, you know, help sort of from the inside out. And also I have a new tip that's not in my book and I haven't talked about it before. If you want me to to tell it here first, (laughs) give give up your secret. (laughs) So, um, we've been, uh, working with various peptides over the past couple of years. And what are peptides? Those are short chain amino acids. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like a protein is a longer chain amino acid. So now there, there, there's been so much study done with different peptides and people are taking them because it helps with cell signaling systems. So, I mean, this is a whole other topic. Um, and generally you want to go through a functional medicine doctor to that, you know, or really educate yourself on how how to use them. They're, they're easy to use. And generally speaking, they're very safe. And, um, even like when they study some peptides at high doses, they can't find the amount that would sort of make it toxic because they have a very short half-life. They go in, they signal the cells and then they leave the body. Mm. Again, this is very general. Um, there's an international peptide society. Uh, you can find information there. Um, and, uh, you know, various, there's some good podcasts on peptides too with, with doc, like Dr. William Seeds. Uh, or Dr. Daniel Stickler. So if you want to go into it, you can go down that path. And it's really, it's great stuff to know right now, especially for building the immune system. And then there's different peptides that help even generate the kind of microbial peptides that get generated within the sun. Um, And they are ones that help to repair leaky gut, like no other, you know, like, like, dietary changes might repair a leaky gut, you know, it might take years. Whereas there are peptides that can really help within, you know, a matter of weeks or months, depending on the person and the protocol. Wow. Yeah. So there's, so, I mean, we could talk about that right now for about 20 hours, but yeah. I'll try and make it. <laughs> so the whole thing with, because this made me think about, so when we're working with our food, with food and pigment, because it's all about the melanin and melanin, which is what makes us tanned or also gives us varying degrees of skin color um, from Irish to African. It's like it's about our melanin. And in the first layer of skin, the epidermis, which is so thin, it's only one millimeter thick. Uh, there's five layers 
And the fourth layer, just before the basement layer, uh, the basal cell layer, which is also referred to as the basement layer, is the melanin layer. And that's where you have the melanocytes and there's all that activity. So it's a deeper layer. And then there's a peptide called melanotan, generally uh, with a number two afterwards. So it's called melanotan two. And it's cell signaling for the melanocytes in the body. So besides a number of things that it does for immune system, it helps people that have had a mold exposure. Uh, it does also seem to have a good effect on libidos. The other thing it does is you get a tan with it by literal, but you have it's because it's activating your melanocytes. So, um, what we have been experimenting with is just doing like a one, uh, one MCG, a very tiny, tiny amount. And it, it, uh, most peptides are done through a subcutaneous injection, which is another thing, but it's a very easy, it's like an insulin needle and you just find a little fleshy part and put it in. It's easier than doing like a B12 shot even. So anyway, it activates the melanocytes and then a tan is created, which can then is like the best um, sunscreen, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and then what I've also found in our experiments is that you do, you need to take the melanotan and you really only need one, depending on, I don't know, we were already had a good base layer, but one or two, and it's got to be in a time when you're going to have sun exposure. So in the middle of the winter, when you're not going to see the sun for a couple months, isn't the best time because it seems to just get further activated by the sun. But you literally have like the most even glowing base layer ever. And while we were traveling, we found it so uh, awesome for our son because kids, you know, they just generally, they're not lying in the sun, right? It's like they're active, they're mm -hmm. doing stuff and it's hitting them in different ways. So, you know, part, you may need to sunblock an area or part's going to get more exposure than the other. So anyway, yeah, he was game and we didn't need sunscreen. Like we make our own, we make like natural, um, everybody loves the sunshine with zinc, which is different than a sunscreen because it blocks the rays. So if you can find something natural with zinc, it's got to be, you know, not rancid and, and a good non-coated, non-nanoized zinc. Um, that will just deflect the rays. So that's why zinc is an old time and, and very uh, non-toxic sun protection. But it's going to block, it's deflecting the rays off your body and then we make an Everybody Loves the Sunshine oil, which is like a golden tanning oil. It's going to, you know, harmonize your time in the sun. You know, you may get another half hour if you've got a good base tan. Or for some people, if they're just starting out, it may add like kind of like another or 10, 10 or 15 minutes um, of priming their skin for the sun, you know, so they don't get burnt. But it's not a sunblock but it will prolong and get your skin harmonized to those sun's rays with the goal of tanning. Mm -hmm. And then the, the zinc is just like, I don't want, you know, the sun on my nose or shoulders right now. So I'm going to block it. Yeah. But with the melanotan, the base layer is so thorough and complete that, um, you know, and we, and, and we've had other friends on the trip try it as well. And it was such a great thing. Uh, so you just have one tiny shot and you're like, go out and suntan you're good for the season that's crazy that seems so like space age but really all you're doing is just putting this little peptide into your body that yeah, is which activating is a those cells yeah and it's a biologic so it's like uh, uh -huh. you know really good form of um medicine and if you know there's no you know it's not like a synth uh full synthetic uh, pharmaceutical. It's like totally right. different. It totally is a different thing with the body. And you're not putting in a substance, you're making things sort of activate and wake up. Mm -hmm. And then your body's doing the work. Right. If that makes sense. So yeah. even for uh, like in, you know, different, we're not, we don't know these realms, but sort of like the body, you know, steroid realm of body working out, they've been into to like human growth hormone for a few decades, but there was right. obviously issues with that because you're putting a hormone and so you can kind of blow a fuse, so to speak, with the receptors. Mm. But now there's a class of peptides that act like secretagogues. And so those will then just activate your own human growth hormone. And so it's a whole other ball game wow, yeah. because we still have all that in our bodies. It just kind of kind of gets a bit dull as we have more 
circles around the sun. You know, with aging, some of this activity gets decreased, but we still have like HGH in our pituitary gland, you know, so it's just about signaling it. Right. That so cell it's, signaling is so yeah. important for so, for every function in the body. Totally. Yeah. And so I'm excited to even, you know, I'm just wondering too about, you know, the, the melanotan and vitamin D level. So I think there's a lot more to explore there, but seriously on a scale of like set it and forget it. Sun, it's not sunblock, I guess, sun protection, sun harmonizing factor. Um, wow. There's such a good solution. Yeah, that's amazing. Is that going to be available to people at some point? Well, that that's not something that we would uh, venture into selling. I mean, I would do, you know, we're working on creams with peptides and things that would be more related. But that, you know, you ought to be very, you want to get from a very good source. So that's why, you know, looking at the peptide society where they have uh, people that they work with. Mm-hmm. Um, there's Can Labs that has a good one. Um, tailor-made compounding, but sometimes you need a prescription to go through that because there's just d- obviously quality. There's quality ones, and then there's ones that are not made with such quality, and then you know you won't know what to expect. And that's you know, so quality is key as usual, which I would you know I feel like even you know quality with the zinc or the quality quality is so key quality of food, mm. you know. But yeah. the fun thing about the sun <laughs> is it's it's great for it's like equal <laughs> quality for all if you can yeah. access it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no company that can <laughs> make poor quality sunlight available. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um I I listened to a really interesting episode of the Wise Traditions podcast, the Weston mm. A. Price Foundation's podcast, and it was called, I think, Light Eaters or We Are Light Eaters. With, oh, fun. Yeah, with Dewey Lehman. Mm. And, you know, one idea that really struck me was he he pointed out that food is just sunlight slowed down into matter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. which is such yeah. a beautiful thought. And Wait. go ahead. So I was just going to say, and to me, that like I feel so passionate about, you know, so pesticides, they literally affect the, the photosynthesis. Right. So it's like the shadow over the food and then if like with animals and chickens and eggs and cows and butter and all that realm it's all factory farm so they're living in the shadows producing you know besides all the inhumane and the toxins and all of that so it's just this shadow food and it's not grown in the sunlight so that's why we get other vitamins nutrients and different catalysts in you know the chicken that And, um, that's so important because it's only food that's been, um, like the butter from the cow that's been outside or the egg from the chicken that's been outside. That's the only food that's getting that vitamin K2 because Mm. it has to come from food that was eaten with sunlight. Right. That that's also something that they brought up in this is that pastured animals who are outside in the sun and in natural light environments are light eaters, just like the plants are, just like we are. And that that has a huge influence on how that food then affects our bodies, of course. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And D3 and K2, for whatever reason, there's something that's just so magical about that combination. And in our earlier years, like, I don't know, where were we at the beginning of the, of the, of the, Uh, the early aughts where we were like vitamin D, vitamin D kind of in the supplement world. Then we learned, Oh my God, we can't take all that vitamin D without K2. Mm. So you got to get the D3 and the K2 together. And then that's some special combination that, that ushers minerals into the bones. So then the calcium and the magnesium and the phosphorus go into the bones. And if we don't have the D3 and K2 in sufficient amounts, then the minerals just go into the, are just sort of floating around the bloodstream, Mm -hmm. but we need it in the bones. So D3, and as has been known in different ways since ancient times, the sunlight is so essential for bone growth and bone health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, talk about the the Egyptian skulls. Oh, yeah, that's such a fun thing. So they were, as some Greek historian, who I forget the name now, was visiting and writing about visiting this, the battlefield of, um, 
I can't remember the battlefield. Anyways, a Persian Egyptian battlefield and they're visiting it uh, a while later. Like I'm thinking decades, if not like a hundred years later or something. And so there's two skull, they're different skulls. And he's just showing that a rock would, um, shatter the Persian skulls because his theory was that they wore head caps and that a rock couldn't, couldn't even shatter an Egyptian skull because they shaved their heads when they were little to bring in sunlight to the bones. And of course they had a whole culture that was about infusing the body with sunlight. Mm -hmm. So he, his, yeah, he was just finding a difference in the, in the quality of the bones. So interesting that they, Mm -hmm. and they knew specifically, we want the sunlight on our scalps. (laughs) We want that direct like seventh, eighth chakra connection. (laughs) Totally. Totally. I remember uh, after giving birth to my son, the midwives were like, okay, well, keep the belly button clean and healthy. The one will be back tomorrow. So I was like, okay. So um, I put a little frankincense on there and tea, drop a tea tree. And then we just, oh, he's so tiny, you know, I mean, this is like day one or day two. I feel like he's the size of my hands, but he's just, we just have him in the sunlight, you know, and it wasn't long because he's fresh. Um you know, just a few minutes and stuff. And they came back the next day and it was completely healed. And they're like, oh my God, that we told you. I'm like, well, you told me to keep it clean. Yeah, <laughs> they're like, well, yeah. you didn't know it was going to heal overnight. <laughs> yeah, it is incredible how quickly sunlight can heal skin conditions. Mm-hmm. Whenever my kids had diaper rash, they just get their oh, butt yeah. in the sun for totally. a few minutes and it's gone. Um, I, I'm just putting this together right now. So I just want to go back to the the way that the sun is intertwined with all the common food advice, which, you know, really we should all be following. And I certainly do. So we talked about pesticides and the importance of organic and then um, outdoors, you know, grass eating or whatever, wild foraging, um, Mm -hmm. livestock animals. But then also in this in this podcast episode, which is number 177, again, of the Wise Traditions podcast, he talks about how important it is, so now we're getting into local food, to eat food that grows in the same light environment that you live in, because mm-hmm. it's giving our bodies the right light information for where we are geographically located on the planet. That makes sense. Totally. I love <laughs> it. <laughs> um, I like that. <laughs> I know. And then I also want to touch on mitochondria. So, so fascinating. And I feel like I can't learn enough about it, partially because it can be really confusing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but oh, also, it's you, so fascinating. Love, if you dive into the mitochondria and peptides. Mm. Mm. <laughs> because are they, are they feeding the mitochondria, giving it information on how All to different kinds create of the Almost energy? Like just the going like, oh, remember mm. mitochondria, how you functioned at 20? Mm-hmm. Mm. <laughs> That sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, again, that epigenetic information. Yes. What, what we can be doing to turn our genes on and off. Totally. So my, mitochondria are the um, energy producing parts of our cells. And most of us think when we think of what what feeds our mitochondria, we think of food and oxygen and air. This is what I often see people saying. This is what feeds your mitochondria. But sunlight is yeah. also very much feeding our mitochondria. And this guy, again, Dewey Lehman in that episode said that two-thirds of the energy in our mitochondria comes from the sunlight and one-third comes from food. Oh, I love that. It's amazing. And that when you are getting enough sun, you feel the need to eat less food. Yeah, generally. There's just a, yeah, there's a, a harmonizing going on. And that's supposed to be, you know, said of sun gazing too, is that it's just providing other information at that, you know, at those special times of the day. It's like another kind of diet, you know, it's like cosmic ethers. Yeah. You know, so this is my next question. Tell us yeah. about the role of vision and sun synthesis and sun gazing and sunglasses. Mm. Yeah. So sun so, gazing was new to me and I still I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> So I'm excited to hear it straight from your mouth. Well, you know, what's fun is I just recently, just through chance of, you know, the weather and travel and then having to travel to a few places, I just recently had, as I feel like a little miracle in life, 28 days in a row consecutively of sunset sun gazing, which is amazing because even in the summer, I mean, it's going to be cloudy or rainy 
at some point where we live anyway. (laughs) So that was, so I'm fresh off of that (laughs) and I feel super charged. It, you know, it's a beautiful, if you just really like, just on the basics of like, you know, watching the sunrise or sunset and taking that moment for, you know, as much as, you know, for that first 40 minutes and last 40 minutes of the day is totally special. And even if it, you know, didn't do anything quote unquote magical, I think that's an awesome thing to do. (laughs) You know, it's very meditative. You can just, you just, you feel gratitude. You, you feel, you tune into that consistency of the cosmos that is just like way bigger than our thoughts. So I think it's an amazing thing to do. And, you know, it was practiced in ancient cultures and yeah, it was said to, you know, give prana and energy and nourishment and people that do water fasting do try and do things like sun gazing to kind of get another type of prana. It does also supercharge the super chiasmatic nucleus, which is in the center of our brains and it helps our circadian rhythms which is very, you know, important. And, and many ancient cultures literally designed, so I was talking about the, our, the structure of our economy doesn't really allow for engaging with the sun in a lot of areas. But, you know, really town, towns, so to speak, like, you know, ancient Egyptian kind of was designed around the sun and ancient Greece because it was just such a part of their day. And now, you know, we're busy. We got work to do. We're in front of screens eyesight has de- is declining on so many levels and um you know we need the sunlight more than ever to to help strengthen our eyes and in various books that help uh like take off your glasses and see or even Aldous Huxley wrote a book called The Art of Seeing which was about his journey uh and his blindness but also things that he could do to improve vision and, um, so we do, we need to bring sunlight into our eyes. If, if you walk outside and you're immediately squinting, um, you're wanting to retrain your eyes and the muscles around your eyes to receive more sunlight to prevent eyesight declining. And if it's too much to absorb, even at sunrise and sunset, the, the light of the sun, then you can put a hand over one eye at a time and just allow one eye to bring in the light. And then that will strengthen your eyes. But if you if you go out in the middle of the day and it's sunny and you're like, whoa, um, you got to you want to improve that. That's a, that's a big sign. And that's very important for growing eyes to, you know, see horizon lines, be outside, engage with sunlight and get out from under the screen so that those lit so that the eyes literally develop. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I've heard a lot about myopia being on the rise, including Mm -hmm. in young children, because we're just looking at screens or even with books, you know, if you're spending most of your time looking at something close to your face. So I often I'm doing I do it whenever I'm on a podcast call is I'm looking at the farthest ponderosa pine tree I can see (laughs) the whole time. Um, But this is so interesting, too, to think about this quality of sunlight being so important for our visual health. And so to be clear, You're talking about the hour after sunrise and the hour before sunset and looking directly at the sun? Yeah, depending on where you are and how strong it is. It's like somewhere between an hour to 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, That, yeah, totally, it's safe at that time. But obviously, you know, you might have to adjust your eyes a bit. But, you know, and it it just feels good. And if you can, you know, get your bare feet on the earth at the same time, all of that's going to help. And I did want to also mention, because you mentioned about sunglasses. So a really neat thing that came out of that those clinics in Switzerland, in Lausanne, Switzerland in the 1920s, where they were, people were coming all over the world to heal. And it's really, I do uh, recommend just looking at on Google for images of that because you can see Dr. Auguste Rollier and these clinics where they look like hospitals with huge verandas um, or kids walking around in the snow with kind of these just little diaper shorts on so they can get full exposure. And then also some of the before and afters of like kids kind of hunched and not good bone formation. And then like many months later, having a little healthy glow and sitting upright and it's just simple, sweet healing. Mm -hmm. Um, But he found that if you wore sunglasses, you wouldn't get any of the benefits of the sun. But if you were in the shadow, in the shade, like a shadow under a tree, you could still get benefits of the sun. 
from obviously not tanning, but in, in the vision and eyesight. But the healing, the really healing uh, wouldn't occur for people, even if they were just sun tanning. Uh, with the sun. So there's something about the sun receiving the rays and not blocking it. Um, now, obviously, there's going to be times for sunglasses, like driving. and mm-hmm. There's moments, but just like when you're really doing your sunning, you know, you want to go for it. And, uh, you know, and then if you're gardening or doing different things, then I think um, if you can, don't wear your sunglasses. Yeah, that makes so much sense to me. It, um, I don't like sunglasses. I, I feel like I want to see the world as it is, you know, for mm-hmm. sure if I'm driving and there's a glare, but there's my whole life, you know, people just love their sunglasses, but it always kind of felt like weird to me. Yeah. Like, I don't know, almost like. I knew I was blocking out something important or I just wanted to like see the world as it is, you know, interact with it as it is. Yeah. I felt the same way. I mean, I always liked having a pair, but, um, definitely I'm always like getting them off my face and just being with the sun. That being said too, and all about eye hygiene, I do really recommend, you know, downloading something like flux onto your computers, which helps manage the blue light. Um, iPhone. I have my iPhone on um, night shift, twenty four hours a day, mm-hmm, and I, I just take it off to edit a photo. And then yep. definitely, once the sun goes down, I have my my blue blocking glasses on for any, even in the middle of the night, if I had to get up and maybe check the time or something, mm-hmm. I put on my blue my blue blockers, yeah, um, just to not get that like shock to the system. Yeah. I am so glad to hear I'm not the only one who's yeah. red shifted all day on my phone because <laughs> people are, my husband's like, what? You know, like, it's just, <laughs> it just like hurts my eyes. It's weird. Oh yeah. Now without it, I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. To think, especially at night that I ever I looked at that. I know. Full force, especially. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I also just want to put in there that you recommend when people are just starting sun gazing to do 20 seconds the first day and then add 20 seconds a day. So you're not starting like full on. Yeah. And use your intuition on that. And, you know, I don't know how you, you know, how much indoor work or screen work you've been doing, but you can build into it, build up to it. Uh Just like tanning, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, I mean, and yet another thing, you know, that we've been told our whole lives, if you look yeah. into the sun at all, like you will go crazy and die. Yeah. I mean, it's not <laughs> something they need to do at high noon, but right. no. still. <laughs> um, okay. And I just want to say now, cause people likely have other questions about like, how exactly should I be laying out and stuff? And you just cover all of this in the book. There's so much information and a lot more than we can go into, but one more thing, and you cover a lot in the book. Like I said, you have the chapter on breast health, which is amazing. And then I was so surprised to see this chapter on oral health in there. I've been really passionate about um, dental hygiene <laughs> ever since I first took a course with a woman named Rupam Henry a few years ago or 10 years ago, I mean, at the Women's Herbal mm. Symposium. And it's been one of those things that's like, everyone should know this. This should be such basic human knowledge. And so I loved loved this chapter. You really blew my mind. And I wanted to read just one sentence. It's actually two. And just kind of, you know, let you riff on them before we okay. <laughs> end our call today. So you write that the mouth is the principal portal into our bodies. It interfaces with, absorbs, and assimilates our world. The endocrine, immune, and digestive systems are intimately bound to the microbiome of our mouths. Oh. <laughs> Most people don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge, huge conversation. But yeah, the oral microbiome is so key along with the uh, skin microbiome. But of course, the oral microbiome hooks up to the gut microbiome. So there's a very, uh, you know, deep connection there. And then, of course, that whole microbiome system is connected to the brain. So yeah, dental health really does affect every part of our body. And I love that chapter um, because it's, it's good. It's, you know, there's a good range and there's also really practical things on, uh, you know, root canals and wisdom teeth, that kind of stuff. And I wrote, I did write a book. uh, My first book was holistic dental care. Mm. So that's an easy read. And then, but there was, you know, some new stuff in the dental chapter as well. But I think that 
the dental chapter is pretty deep in Renegade Beauty. You could totally just start with Renegade Beauty. Yeah. And then we also do, we offer like free consults. Like there's no strings attached. It's literally like you can ask us anything on health and beauty. And, um, you know, Joy was deeply trained and educated by me who does the consults. And we, you know, ask us, you can send us in emails about oral care and we'll, maybe have an answer or direct you to uh, some resources. So we're happy to help. And there's also a number of articles on our, on our website too, about braces and that kind of stuff as well. Wow. And our eight, our eight step protocol. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm also going to be interviewing RuPalm, who I just mentioned on this podcast in a few episodes. So oh, great. people who want to hear that. Um, Oh, yeah, I I don't want to go too deeply into this right now, but um, I've been following a woman on Instagram. Her name there is organic underscore Olivia, and she's an herbalist and her parents have COVID-19 right now. Mm. And so she she was doing some really intensive care with her father before he got admitted to the actual intensive care unit. And she has been she has a really scientific mind and has been going just deep, deep, deep into research papers connected to all this. And one thing that she's finding that a lot of doctors who follow her are confirming they believe is also true is that it's a secondary bacterial infection that really makes the coronavirus so lethal in some people, especially in the lungs and causing the pneumonia. And it's Provotella, I believe is the mm-hmm. name of the bacteria, and that it's Provotella overgrowth is immediately linked to poor oral hygiene and mm. dental health. And mm-hmm. I'm, she's just, it's all in her highlights. There's a ton of scientific studies and doctors chiming in there if you guys want to check it out. But it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, is this finally maybe what um, wakes a lot of more people up to the direct, immediate connection between what's going on in our mouths and what's going on in our guts and therefore the rest of our body? Mm, I love that. And sealing those, those leaky guts, because I think, you know, a cavity and bleeding gums, it's sort of like leaky gums Mm. and a leaky tooth. So we got to really take care of that connection. Yes. And I'm sure too, this is also just to kind of tie back in where cell signaling comes into play. I know it does with leaky gut, at least, you know, you Mm -hmm. need all the cells in your body to be in communication with one another. And I would totally and of course, and as you said, the sun what, helps with that. Where some of the immune peptides are working is a, really in that cellular infection mm-hmm. and, and preventing the virus from repeating itself. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, yeah. So Deep fascinating. <laughs> so, so fascinating. <laughs> and of course, there's a ton of science around vitamin D preventing viral infection in general. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, seriously, get out in the sun. Yeah. Like, like, you know, what, what better thing to do than to just start now? Cause it's spring for a lot of us and yeah. get out there. Cause if this is gonna, you know, we might have our peak and it might carry on. Then we really, I mean, vitamin D and building up your immune system through sun tanning is fun and totally effective. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've just been doing it all all February and March is any day I could as coronavirus was making its way throughout the world and feeling really grateful to have something so simple that's mm-hmm. available to me. And I'm getting my three-year-old naked as often as yes. I can too when she's outside. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, Nadine, thank you. <laughs> I'm so happy to finally connect with you in this way and so grateful for you for bringing this knowledge forward that can be helpful for so many people. Um, absolutely the most just beautiful information packed, poetically written book, Renegade Beauty, reveal and revive your natural radiance. And yeah, just please tell people where they can find you or any offerings you have, or just anything you would like to share about that. Oh, sweet. Well, we're livinglibations.com. You can find me on Instagram at living libations and, um, yeah, they've got, I mean, really Renegade Beauty, if you want to know more really is like my whole heart and brain in a book. Mm-hmm. And again, email us, email us or ask any questions and we're happy to help. That's amazing also that you do that. That's so great. Um, okay. Thank you so very much, Nadine. I am going to, yep. It's just about the time that my naked sunspot is sunny right now. So as <laughs> soon as we hang up, I'm <laughs> stripping down and laying out. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Okay, have fun. All right. (laughs) 
thank you for taking these medicine stories in. I hope they inspire you to keep walking the mythic path of your own unfolding self. I love sharing information and will always put any relevant links in the show notes. You can find past episodes, my blog, and our handmade herbal medicines at mythicmedicine.love. We've got reishi, lion's mane, elderberry, mugwort, yarrow, redwood, body oils, an amazing sleep medicine, heart medicine, earth essences, so much more, more than I can list there, mythicmedicine.love. While you're there, check out my quiz, which healing herb is your spirit medicine? It's fun and lighthearted, but the results are really in-depth and designed to bring you into closer alignment with both the medicine that you're in need of and the medicine that you already carry and can bring to others. If you love the show, please consider supporting it at patreon.com slash medicine stories. It is so worth your while. There are dozens and dozens of killer rewards there, and I've been told by many folks that it's the best Patreon out there. We've got ebooks, downloadable PDFs, bonus interviews, guided meditations, giveaways, resource guides, links to online learning and behind the scenes stuff, and just so much more. The best of it is available at the $2 a month level. Thank you. And please subscribe on whichever app you use. Just click that little subscribe button and review on iTunes. It's so helpful. And if you do that, you just may be featured in a listener spotlight in the future. The music that opens the show is by Marie Sue. That's M A R I E E. S-I-O-U-X from her beautiful song, Wild Eyes. Thank you, Marie. And thanks to you all. I look forward to next time.